So his name, Sheikh Abdul Fattah bin Muhammad bin Bashir bin Hassan Abu Ghudda. So he was Halabi. Halab is the Arabic name for Aleppo in Syria. And Aleppo is a city in northern Syria. Um, his family, his father was uh, a prominent businessman. His grandfather was even more famous than his father in the family trade. He was born in Halab, Aleppo on the 17th of Rajab, 1336. Uh, that's 1917, the Gregorian calendar. So this is right before the Uthmani Khilafah and the Kemalist uh, movement in Turkey um, rendered the Khilafah as collapsed. His lineage from his family, the Abu Ghudda family, goes up to Sayyidina Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anh, sword of Allah. Other names of the same family, the different branches who also go up to Khalid bin Walid radiallahu anh, who were living in Syria at the time, were Sabbagh and Maqsud. His family trade, as most Halabis or uh, people living in Aleppo, they were dealing in production of fabrics and trade in textile. So his grandfather, Bashir, was quite wealthy um, through that. And so most of these notes that I've prepared are from the son of the author, Muhammad Zahid Abu Ghudda, or Hafidahullah, who's alive. Speaking about uh, Sheikh, Sheikh when he was younger, so his grandfather um, sensed that you know he would be an intelligent person when he grows up. So he enrolled him in the first four years of his education at the Islamic Arab Institute in Aleppo, Halab. After those four years there, where he learned his basics, he continued with the family business of buying and selling or dealing in textile. When he turned 19, he enrolled at the Khasrawi Madrasa, which is now called the Shariya Secondary School in 1356, so 1936. Now he's somewhat, he was a teenager at this time, at end of his teens, um, and he went to, now the way they had it in those days was you would complete normal school, and then after that you would go to a secondary school, kind of like a college, and then if you were still interested, you would go to Al-Azhar to study or to the Lebanese uh, version of Al-Azhar that they had, uh, which also affiliated with the main Al-Azhar University in Cairo. So Sheikh Abdul Fattah, Abdul Fattah he graduated from the Khasrawi Madrasa Shariya Secondary School in Syria in 1362, which is 1942. So he got his basic, he got his basics those first four years, took a break, the family business, and then he was now uh, um, graduated from this university or secondary school and somewhat older, now experienced in life, he went to go travel to Egypt. Now at that time, Egypt was the center of learning uh, as it was for a couple centuries um, at the university, the prestigious university Al-Azhar al-Sharif. Upon get, uh, enrolling there in 1944, he did four years, he did his Bachelor of Arts in Sharia. Ah. And then he furthered his study for another two years by getting a diploma in psychology and methods of teaching. So this uh, diploma of his, it shows that he authored a book, a very nice book, the English translation uh, is published as well, called Al-Rasul Al-Mu'allim, The Prophetic Methods of Teaching. So in there he took all like various examples from Prophet's life on how he was the perfect teacher. So he mentions how Rasulullah used visual aid at times to teach and how he would repeat things to make sure that his, uh, the, the audience, the Sahaba radiallahu would understand the point that he is trying to highlight. So, so the point to note from here is that he did his Bachelor of Arts in Sharia ah, and then after that he did something not directly related to ilm. It was psychology and methods of teaching. But the way we as Muslims living anywhere in the world right now in 2020, we see ourselves as, yes, some of us, whatever we do, it's directly linked to the deen. Some of us, the things that we do, it might not be directly linked, but we can make it 
with the correct intention, we can make it count towards the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and furthering the khidmah. So, now, so his two years that he spent getting that diploma, it helped him author a book. And he mentions in the foreword of that book that, to my knowledge, nobody has ever authored a book focusing specifically on how the Messenger of Allah sallallahu was a perfect teacher, a Rasul al Mu'allim. Now, when he was in Syria, when, when he was younger, um, before he went to Egypt, he studied by many teachers. There's a list of uh, more than 10 of them, but I'm just going to go over very, three of them. So first was Sheikh Ahmad bin Muhammad al zarqa born 1869, passed away 1937, a scholar of fiqh and usul al-fiqh, prominent Hanafi jurist. Now, the name al zarqa is famous because his son, as we'll uh, as I'll show you, uh, I'll show you right now. His son authored many books, so his name is famous as Zarqa. Next, Sheikh Muhammad Najib Sirajuddin. Now, this name Sirajuddin, it's famous because of his son, 1866, 1876 to 1954. He was a scholar of tafsir and fiqh and a prominent orator. Now, what does it mean to be a or be an orator? Is that person is able to you know to give lectures and discourses. But then in those days, it wasn't as easy as it is now, where right now, if anybody in any country can speak the language of the people, then he's an orator, a successful orator, a prominent orator. In those days, 1876, so we're talking about like mid 1900s and um, the beginning of the 20th century, is people had that higher level of literacy among the scholarly classes. So the Arabic that would be accepted as a norm or a spoken was of the highest caliber, where it wasn't just anybody who would be able to string a couple words together and just make an Arabic sentence. People would know how to speak. So, he, so Sheikh Muhammad Najib Tarajuddin, who Sheikh Abdul Fattah al Ghuda studied by, he's the father of Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin, who was a colleague of Sheikh Abdul Fattah al Ghuda and a revered scholar of Aleppo. Now, this name, Abdullah Sirajuddin, he authored many books in the science of hadith. And he also authored a commentary on the poem of Baykuniya, Manzuma Baykuniya. It's been translated in English. And so, over, overall, in general, Abdullah Sirajuddin, uh, Sheikh Abdullah Sirajuddin, rahimahullah, was a great scholar in, in Usul al Hadith, or Mustalah al Hadith. And lastly, um, Sheikh Mustafa Zarqa, born 1901, passed away in 1999, authored many books. The son of Sheikh Ahmad Zarqa, great scholar in fiqh, comparative fiqh, so fiqh al-muqarin, comparing the various madhahib, uh, Arabic grammar and literature. So this was his main, th these were some of his main teachers in Syria, but he had many more than those. The main teachers in Egypt, I just chose a few of them who were more prominent or famous, but there are many. Again, he, some of his teachers uh, went on to become um, Sheikh Muhammad Al Khidr Hussein. He became the Grand Sheikh of Al Azhar. So, anyways, the first Sheikh Mustafa Sabri, Rahimahullah, 1869 to 1954. The last Sheikh Al Islam of the Uthmani Khilafa. Um, he lived in poverty uh, with dignity. Um, but the, the thing about the scholars of the past is that they would not want to become cozy with governments that were not Islamic. Okay? So now when he was in exile after the Kamalist Revolution, um, World War I, he went to exile in Egypt. So a point to note is that many of the other Muslim countries at that time were not affording refuge to those people, scholars leaving Turkey or Uthmani Khilafah. But Egypt, it was an autonomous state while the Uthmani Khilafah was ruling. So they had some sort of mutual understanding, which is why many scholars from the Uthmani Khilafah moved in exile to Egypt because Egypt took them in. So Sheikh Mustafa Sabri was a scholar of Hadith, Usul al-Fiqh, Hanafi, and comparative Fiqh philosophy and politics. Again, the requirements of a Shaykh al-Islam were really high compared to our, you know, average uh, person who's completed four-year course or a six-year course in an Islamic university right now. To be the Shaykh al-Islam 
the 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 face of the Islamic, uh, you know, orthodox scholarship of the Uthmani Khilafa had its really high criteria. So that's why you can see that he learned the Islamic sciences as well as philosophy and politics. Politics, diplomacy, being able to uh, get along with people of various understandings, people who like you know the Young Turk movement, who were of different understandings of of uh, whether Islam needed a revamp, things like that. The next. Sheikh Muhammad Zahid Al Kothari, uh, rahimahullah Taala, he was an Ottoman scholar. So, th this is what was written in the book. But doing some research, I realized that Sheikh Muhammad Zahid Al Kothari, rahimahullah, he was not Arab, nor was he Turkish. He was actually um, from those countries, Mawara un Nahar. So Arabic was not his first language. But if you read about him, Sheikh uh, Alam Al Kothari, Alam Al Kothari is that his Arabic was absolutely profound and he would speak Arabic better than most people who spoke, most Arabs who spoke Arabic at that time in the Uthmani Khilafah. So he was the secretary to Sheikh al-Islam, Mustafa Sabri, rahimahullah. He was also living in exile in Egypt, scholar of Hadith, Usul al-Fiqh, Hanafi, and comparative Fiqh, and author of many books. Uh, Alama Kothari wrote many books which are in print today. Some of them are actually been translated. Some of them are taught as books. Uh, as, as textbooks in universities and uh, madaris. And the third name which really stuck out to me was uh, Imam Shaheed Hassan Banna, born 1906, passed away in 1949, the founder of Muslim Brotherhood. Now, this was a political party, um, which information is available online, but the political party was based on Islamic ideals. And they were, uh, at one point, the only uh, Muslim organization who was interested in helping Palestine. Not for any personal gain, but for the benefit of the Palestinians um, themselves. So when Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda returned to Syria, he, taught, he returned in 1951. So after graduating from Egypt, he returned in 1951 and became, so, so he wrote an entrance exam and attained first place and was then asked to be the head teacher for the Islamic education in the schools in Halab. So he taught for 11 years while writing the entire curriculum for Islamic studies at secondary schools. So these were the government schools and religious schools which were specifically focused uh, or exclusively focused on Islamic studies. So like the Madaris or the equivalent of the Darul Ulums. Um, besides that, his other khidma while teaching was he was actively engaged in the fields of da'wah through the Muslim Brotherhood, was eventually selected as the group's leader. They had a lot of confidence in him. Um, and so besides his uh, activities through the Muslim Brotherhood, he was also having his, uh, he would have weekly sessions where thousands of people would come and it would be a Q and A session where you know people would ask him, Sheikh, what do we do in this situation, or what do you say about this? And he would answer that when he was speaking about fiqh or about hadith. Now, it seems very easy right now to you know have a panel discussion, but now imagine one person being asked by thousands of people, and imagine the confidence that all those people had in him that he would be able to give them a satisfactory answer, and his caliber of ilm that he would be able to furnish the answer for all of them, like, you know, to be on, on the, at the spot of the moment, be able to answer that, okay, this hadith means this, or this is the fiqh that's derived from this specific hadith, all of that. It's a very great thing to understand. Just try and imagine that. Now, um, in 1962, he was elected as a member of parliament for Halab, for Aleppo. Um, despite the fierce opposition that people who, you know, the seasoned contenders, people who regularly would, you know, would uh, run for a candidacy. Um, he used his position to assist and promote the interests of Muslims at that time, because looking at 1950s, 60s, 70s, this was a time where there was a lot of um, Arabic nationalism or uh, patriotism that was being promoted, that we are Arabs first and then Muslims. So this had caught up with many of the countries um, who were trying to show themselves as revolutionary and, uh, you know, more up to date with the Western uh, industry. So in 
so after he was elected um, as the member of parliament for Halab, he was then eventually arrested by the, the military um, and they had some charges that they had against him because he was in that position that they arrested all the pol- uh, a few of the political people individuals who weren't towing the line um, but this happened in 1966 and after spending 11 months in Palmyra which is uh, Syria one of Syria's military prisons he was released in the war of 1967 um, this was a war that took place between uh, Israel, Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, I believe. And it was a, it was a very short war. So he was released uh, in that war. Um, before moving to Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, while he was still in Syria, he, um, the, so the, there was the Rabita al-Alam al-Islamiyya, which was the Muslim World League. And this, so each country where there are Muslim majority uh, population, they had a seat in this organization. So the Syrian seat had become vacant at the death of Sheikh Hassan Haban, uh, Habanaka. So in 1978, Sheikh Abdul Fattah Abu Ghudda rahimullah, was elected to fill the Syrian seat at that uh, forum. He then went to Riyadh, where uh, he taught at the Imam Muhammad, Sa- Muhammad bin Saud University, Islamic University in Riyadh. So the main Islamic university in South Africa, or sorry, in uh, Saudi is the University uh, of Medina Munawwara, then the Umbul Qura University in Mecca Mukarrama, and then this Imam Muhammad bin Saud University of Riyadh. These were the main three universities that had the backing of the government, and they were they were promoted as Islamic universities. So he lectured there for 25 years as well as lecturing at the Higher Institute for the Qudla, so the Qadi, the plural form of Qadi is Qudla, so judges. So he lectured at the Higher Institute for Judges. So um, as of now, in Saudi, the judicial system, there's still the Qadi who passes the ruling. So to become a Qadi, the uh, person would complete the normal course of Sharia and then they would go to this Higher Institute for Judges, kind of like law school uh, or advanced law school. He also lectured at Umm Durman University in Sudan, uh, Sana'a University in Yemen. And while he traveled to many countries, he would lecture er, and, and have teaching sessions, uh, including India, Pakistan, Morocco, Qatar, uh, Algeria, Jordan, Iraq, Turkey, it's many countries. So majority of his writing happened when he was in Saudi Arabia. So he wrote, edited, and published over 65 kitabs. Um, which and there are many that are there are there are in circulation some of them are harder to find but he he did sterling work um through in the in the field of authoring books with another 40 that he still was working on when he had passed away um his family he married uh, lady fatima al-hashmi in 1951 again if you look in 1950 he graduated from al-azhar came back and then he married in Syria when he graduated. He was together with her for 46 years. Meaning when he passed away, she was, uh, so she was widowed. He had from that, from, uh, he had three sons and eight daughters. Um, one of them being Muhammad Zahid, the one who translated the book that we are going to be covering, inshallah, in a few weeks. The circumstances behind him passing away is that in 1973, he had a heart attack. And ever since then, he, you know, his heart condition wasn't as stable. In 1989, he complained of deterioration in his sight. He was taken to King Khalid Eye Hospital um, and diagnosed uh, as a macular degeneration. So laser treatment was suggested. He did that, but it was not very successful. It stopped the disease from spreading further. Um, then he was he was invited back to Syria by Hafiz uh, al Assad in 1995. Around that time he went back. People so he was invited through Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al Buti, uh, rahimahullah, passed away 2013. 
Sheikh Sheikh Bouti got through to him and asked him that you know the people uh, the government over here the president has requested your presence. So he came and the people were very happy to see him because he was there he had he was lecturing in Riyadh for 25 years he, he had left you know uh, again in late 1996 his sight deteriorated he had to go to Riyadh at the King Khalid Eye Hospital uh, for treatment it didn't work out that well and it ended up having catastrophic uh, health problems for him where his head he had a headache and his he had intense pain in his eyes um so then in ramadan he was hospitalized and his condition became bad and then he passed away in riyadh on sunday the 9th of shawwal right after ramadan 1417 which is 16th of february 1997 he was then buried in al-baqi in madina munawwara